Greetings, uh, this is Dr. Carl Golnick. Uh, I am just trying to get into my slideshow mode here. And here we go. So hopefully you are all seeing my title slide um, of Ocular Motility Part 2, Brainstem Orbit and Neuromuscular Junction. In our, our Part 1, we covered uh, the ocular motility examination uh, and mostly ocular motor cranial nerve palsy. So in this uh, uh, Part 2, we'll be covering, in a sense, everything else. Uh, and my objectives, therefore, are that when we are done, you'll be able to describe and illustrate common brainstem ocular motility syndromes. You'll be describe and illustrate orbital causes of motility deficits and illustrate various ocular manifestations of myasthenia gravis. So this is a cartoon uh, from the far side, a, a bunch of dinosaurs sitting around saying, well, time for our weekly brainstem storming. Uh, session. So that's a clue to what we're talking about here, which uh, we'll start with this gentleman um, who is has double vision. Um, you'll see his eye movements. And this is a polling question. So there will be a poll and you can choose with your keyboard the correct answer. Uh, and so you'll see him looking, trying to look to the right and left. And right again, I think I think I showed the uh, that he has good vertical eye movements. Here we are. The video is uh, repeating. So is that vertical eye movements are good, but there is a problem. And the question, and hopefully you're you're voting, and we're polling here, is uh, yes. It, what does this represent? Is this myasthenia gravis? Is this third nerve palsy? Is this uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia? Or is this Graves' disease or thyroid eye disease? And so I will let you vote for just a little longer. This is, I guess, somewhat doesn't necessarily hit you over the head, depending on how much eye movement stuff you look at. But um, why don't we go ahead and thank you. So good. So half of you, indeed, uh, got the correct answer. This is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Some of you said myasthenia, which is... Uh, certainly could be, as I say, and we'll talk about myasthenia later. Myasthenia can mimic any pattern of ocular alignment or ophthalmoplegia. Uh, this could be a third nerve palsy. The, what, the finding that we're seeing is the, a, a, a moderate left adduction deficit. But if you look as, at the abducting eye, the right eye, you'll see that there is some abducting nystagmus. So those are the two things we look for with an INO, an, uh, a uh, unilateral adduction deficit, and then a contralateral abducting nystagmus. You can see it right there. There's a few beats of it. So this is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And, oops, sorry, uh, an INO, uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, is again uh, characterized by an ipsilateral adduction deficit, contralateral abducting nystagmus. There may or may not be a vertical misalignment. We call that a skewed deviation if you see it in association with an INO, and we'll talk about skewed deviations in a moment or two. You may or may not see that. And when I say nystagmus, I don't mean the abducting nystagmus, but sometimes you will see a conjugate, often torsional or maybe vertical nystagmus uh, in the setting of an INO. And if you see that, then you quickly know that this has got to be a brainstem problem, and it's not, say, myasthenia mimicking an INO. So uh, in, the, in the anatomy, the relevant anatomy is shown on this uh, schematic where uh, there's a problem with the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which contains the interneurons from the third nerve nucleus. I I'm sorry, the, the interneurons that run from the PPRF uh, and the sixth nerve nucleus up to the medial rectus uh, subnucleus of the third nerve nucleus and then to the medial rectus muscle. And so that's why you have this I and O. You could, it, you could see a, uh, an isolated adduction deficit with a third nerve palsy, but that would be very rare. And in fact, uh, in almost 30 years of neuro-ophthalmology, I've never seen an isolated medial rectus abnormality. So when you see that, think about I and O, brainstem, and clearly you're going to get an imaging study. In a young person, you're going to be thinking about demyelinating disease, I guess, depending on where you live in the world, and in an older person, a lacunar stroke or infarct, uh, typically in the ponds. 
And here's the schematic in the ponds showing the MLFs right center here, side by side, uh, and a small lesion here, an MS plaque, a lacunar infarct can cause a unilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia in the patient we just saw. It was a left INO. Here's another woman who's exotropic, and you can see here she is looking in left, trying to look to left. Here she is up. She's got a little bit of that conjugate nystagmus. And here she is in right gaze with the abducting nystagmus and left gaze. So she's got a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Good vertical eye movements, but striking bilateral adduction deficits. And when she looks up in just a moment, watch the fine vertical nystagmus. See it? Tells us that this is brainstem. This is not myasthenia mimicking a bilateral INO, which I've seen. So a bilateral INO, sometimes this is termed webino, wall-eyed bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Here's another patient with a much more subtle problem, a younger guy, and you'll notice that he doesn't quite have full adduction of the left eye, but when he looks quickly from side to side, he has slow, bilaterally slow adduction. And it's kind of hard to see. You gotta sort of sit back, and watch the eyes move from side to side, and you'll see that the adducting eye, when he tries to saccade a rapid eye movement, the adducting eye is not moving as fast, and this can be subtle, but he has actually got bilateral INOs. They're mild. Sometimes people call them saccadic. Left INO more striking than the right. In a young patient, this is almost all, in the United States, this is almost always multiple sclerosis. Again, a very small lesion can affect both medial longitudinal fasciculi, giving you that bilateral intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. Here's another patient with a different brainstem syndrome, um, and I'm gonna play this, and you'll see here uh, attempting to look left, which looks pretty good. And here she is trying to look right. So in the case where neither eye moves in a certain direction, we call that a gaze palsy. You would not use the term unilateral gaze palsy or a left up gaze palsy. Gaze palsy by definition means neither eye is moving in a certain direction. In her case, she has a right gaze palsy, a right gaze palsy. So when you use the term gaze palsy, you mean neither eye is moving in the direction in question. So in this patient, a right gaze palsy. And this can be due, again, here's our cross section through the pons. So we have the medial longitudinal fasciculi. We have the sixth nerve nucleus. We have the PPRF, the paramedian pontine reticular formation, thought of as the horizontal gaze center. But the sixth nerve nucleus also is part of that. And a small lesion in the sixth nerve nucleus can cause a horizontal gaze palsy, an ipsilateral horizontal gaze palsy. So a nuclear sixth nerve lesion does not just give you a sixth nerve palsy because of the inner neurons that run through the PPRF, that run from the PPRF through the sixth nerve nucleus. You could also have a lesion right in the PPRF causing a unilateral gaze, horizontal gaze palsy and sometimes I'll see a lesion that affects the PPRF and the sixth nerve fascicle. And they'll have a partial gaze palsy plus a sixth nerve palsy. That makes it a little more complicated. But suffice it to say, small lesions, if the person comes in with just a gaze palsy, it's going to be a small lesion because there's all, all this other information in the brainstem. But small lesions in these areas can cause a hor ipsilateral, horizontal gaze palsy. Here's a schematic uh, from Walsh and Hoyt's Clinical Neuroophthalmology. I've kind of cut it off, I'm sorry. You can get the idea that here he is in primary position. When he tries to look to the left, neither eye moves to the left, so that's a left gaze palsy. When he tries to look to the right, the, the left eye does not move, so he's got a striking adduction deficit, but the right eye does move, and if this were a video, you would see some abducting nystagmus. So this person has a left INO, they have a left gaze palsy, and we call that a one and a half syndrome. So the one is the gaze palsy, the half is the INO, a one and a half syndrome. And that again can be caused by a very small lesion 
that might affect both the PPRF, the horizontal gaze center, and the MLF. So you get the horizontal gaze palsy, you get the I and O. It could be a lesion here that affects the MLF and the six nerve nucleus. Remember that a six nerve nuclear lesion causes a horizontal gaze palsy because of the inner neurons running from the PPRF through the nucleus. So small lesions could give you a one and a half. It says my internet connection is unstable. That's not good. Here's a patient with, uh, hopefully the video will play. This is a, obviously an elderly woman. She's got some, a little bit of abducting nystagmus. She has a mild adduction deficit. Here she is trying to look to the left. So she's got a complete left gaze palsy and a left partial left I and O. This is my best video of a left one and a half. So again, small lesion that affects both the MLF and either the PPRF or the six nerve nucleus. So one and a half. Okay, here's a young woman in her 20s uh, that came in with uh, double vision. And you can see I'm doing a cross, a cross cover test just to highlight that she has got a little vertical misalignment of her eyes. You'll notice, and I'll show you, I think my next slide's another video, but in primary position, her eyes are pretty stable, but she's got a little right hyper tropia, and that's why she's having the double vision. This did not fit any cranial nerve pattern. But when we, when we had her look upward, watch what we see. You see conjugate, both eyes, have a little upbeat nystagmus, little upbeat. So knowing we see that conjugate vertical nystagmus, this has got to be brainstem or cerebellum. And so she has a little vertical misalignment that doesn't fit any cranial nerve pattern and mild upbeat nystagmus, worse in up gaze. So something's going on in the central nervous system, and we call this little vertical misalignment a skew deviation. So a skew deviation, in my opinion, is kind of a wastebasket term uh, for a vertical misalignment of CNS, central nervous system origin, um, and that doesn't, that's not a third nerve palsy, not a fourth nerve palsy, it's not some orbital process. It can be comitant, which means about the same wherever you look, or it can be incomitant. You don't see ophthalmoplegia with this because it is a supranuclear problem, supranuclear. So there's no ophthalmoplegia, just misalignment. Uh, in her case, this young lady's case, um, in the United States, the most common cause of this would be uh, demyelinating disease or MS. And her MRI indeed showed these typical plaques that we see with multiple sclerosis. So she had a skew deviation, a vertical misalignment of the eyes of central nervous system origin that doesn't fit a third, doesn't fit a fourth. Here's a young fellow with an interesting story. He saw an ophthalmologist who called me and said, hey, I've got, I've got this young guy, he's a college student, and all he complains about is some blurry vision when he rides his mountain bike. And you know how college students are, they're not very cooperative, and I wasn't sure what he meant. And I said, oh, I'm not sure, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, he won't really look up. And here he is trying to look up. So his horizontal eye movements aren't bad, not great for maybe a 20 year old, but there's his horizontal movements to the right. They're full to the left. Down gaze is okay, maybe not completely full for a young healthy person, but when he tries to look from down to up, he's just, he has an up gaze palsy. Neither eye moves up, so we call it a gaze palsy. In his case, since they're not moving up, it's an up gaze palsy. Now I want you to notice one other thing, or two other things. Number one, he's got some, some lid retraction. His lids are very, watch when he tries to look at his eyelids for a moment here. His lids are open real wide. So he's got some lid retraction. And when he looks from down to up, his eyes have some funny sort of rapid movements that look sort of like nystagmus. And indeed, this is called convergence retraction nystagmus. And the eyelid retraction you're seeing as an eponym called Collier sign. So this is not thyroid eye disease, which also has lid retraction, uh, but this is 
something else. So I asked the doctor who told me, you know how college students are, they're not that cooperative. I asked him, well, how about his pupils? And he said, well, that's funny. His pupils aren't very cooperative either. And here are his pupils reacting to light. And you can see almost no reaction to light. But watch in a moment, he'll be looking at a near target. Here he goes right now. And he has nice constriction of that pupil. And when he looks in the distance, it quickly dilates. So it constricts to near, but the pupil does not move to light. We call this pupillary light near dissociation. So he has got a multiple findings of light near dissociation, lid retraction, upgaze palsy, and convergence, retraction, nystagmus. So hopefully most of you will know what that constellation of findings means. And here's the, here's, let's see if you do. So this is our second polling slide. Does this represent uh, Argyle Robertson pupil? Does this represent 80s tonic pupil? Is this a problem in the dorsal midbrain or does this person have bilateral third nerve palsies? So I'll give you about 15 seconds to vote and we'll see what the audience thinks about this. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what the audience says. So very good. So two thirds of you say dorsal midbrain syndrome, which is exactly correct. Argy it's true that Argyle Robertson pupils are a cause of pupillary light near dissociation, as is a tonic pupil. However, those are isolated pupillary problems. And this is certainly not an isolated pupillary problem. A couple people said bilateral thirds, very unlikely that bilateral thirds are gonna cause just elevation deficits and of course, you shouldn't see light near dissociation just with third nerve palsies um, and certainly not uh, lid retraction. You should see ptosis, right? So the correct answer is dorsal midbrain. And again, this has another um, eponym. Whoops, sorry, let me go back. Another eponym, paranodes dorsal midbrain syndrome. And you can see here on our sagittal MRI, here is the midbrain, here is the pons, here is this tumor, which turned out to be a germinoma that was sitting right on his dorsal midbrain, right, right where it should be, causing a dorsal midbrain syndrome. And here's a schematic showing that same view. Uh, and what lives in the dorsal midbrain are the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus and the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, which are part of the, or form the vertical gaze center. So indeed, you can see not only up gaze palsy, you can see up a complete vertical gaze palsy, um, but that's where the lesion should be. And in his case, that's where it was. He actually did very well with treatment uh, and is still doing well to this day. That video is probably at least 15 years old. So we're gonna switch a little bit here. And this is an interesting woman who's 50. Um, this is maybe a little more esoteric. And so what you're seeing here are her attempts at psychotic eye movements. So you can't see me, but I'm asking her to look at my nose and look at my finger. So horizontally, she does pretty well. So here she is, there's a horizontal saccade to my finger and back to my nose, my other finger back to my nose. But what you're seeing now is her attempts at saccading up and down. That's up and somewhere in here is down. And she just can't saccade vertically, but she can saccade horizontally. So she has a problem that's affecting that. Now, otherwise, her symptoms and her, she really doesn't have eye symptoms. In fact, she was sent to me with a specific question. Do I see evidence of a certain condition? Um, her problem and the reason that she sent to me is she's having some problems with her gait. Um, she feels a little bit off balance and she's having some problems uh, with her memory. Uh, I think she was a school teacher and she said, you know, my memory's not terrible, but once in a while, I have trouble remembering how to tie my shoelaces. So here she is pursuing my finger. Now I'm moving my finger slowly as I keep following my finger. I'm moving it up and moving it down. And you'll see that her pursued eye movements are very good. Look at how well she pursues. So this is a condition that affects saccades before it affects pursuit eye movements. Here she is again, pursuing upward and pursuing downward normally. 
So I don't think I'm going to quiz you on this one. This one is a, a tough one, I think. Um, anybody who knows the answer can shout it out, although I won't hear you. So she's got what's called progressive supranuclear palsy. It's got an eponym, which I, I don't think anybody remembers, smith olszewski steele syndrome. But this is a midbrain degenerative disease. And unfortunately, it's often fatal. I think the average, the mean is six years and people die because they develop problems, not just with their balance and walking, but with swallowing. And they often die of aspiration pneumonia. The vertical saccades are affected first. Uh, but this can, that can progress as the condition progresses to actually complete vertical and horizontal ophthalmoplegia. Interestingly, these patients often sometimes have blef not only blepharospasm, but a bad combination, the combination of blepharospasm and apraxia of eyelid opening. Apraxia of eyelid opening means that your eyes close and you just can't open them. It's not a forceful closure, it's just a closure and they won't open. So you can imagine if someone has blepharospasm where they're constantly blinking and shutting their eyes and then they won't open even when they relax, well, that's not a great combination to have. So this is not real common, but I certainly see it. This is oftentimes, not oftentimes, occasionally misdiagnosed early on as Parkinson's disease. And so patients are sometimes sent to me by neurologists to say, hey, do the eyes look like Parkinson's disease or do they look like PSP? All right, so this is a video. This is um, a polling question. I don't know that we'll show the poll yet. Let's watch the um, eye movements. And this is a fellow who has double vision. He's had double vision for a couple of months. Um, you can see his eye movements here. I think you can see from his eye movements that he is esotropic. Um, and his vertical eye movements don't look so bad. His horizontal eye movements are not real normal necessarily. But I also will mention for those of you who were at my part one of the ocular motility, never forget to look at what I call the fellow travelers, the fellow travelers. And for those of you who are at the lecture, maybe that'll clue you into the correct diagnosis. For those of you who weren't, Maybe you'll get it anyway, but we'll talk about what I mean in a moment after we vote by fellow travelers. So let's go ahead and put up the poll and go ahead and cast your votes. What does this represent? Is this myasthenia? Is it six nerve palsy? Is it bilateral? Sorry, that should say, I think I changed my slides since they made up the poll. Should that say bilateral six nerve palsy? Or is this Graves or thyroid eye disease? I'll give you another 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, close it, and let's see what you say. So very good. So again, majority of you have got this correct. Um, the, per the person certainly does have bilateral abduction deficits. So the second most common answer was uh, bilateral six nerve palsies. There are definitely bilateral six nerve palsies. Let me, I'm not sure if you're seeing that or... So he definitely has bilateral abduction deficits. This could be myasthenia because myasthenia can mimic anything. So it could be myasthenia. Um, it's not a unilateral six nerve palsy. It could be bilateral six nerve palsies, but there is a very important fellow traveler. And by fellow travelers, I mean whenever you see somebody with double vision, with, with ophthalmoplegia, you wanna look closely at least at two other things. Number one, the pupils, which I'm not really showing you. And number two, the eyelids. Look at that right there. He has got marked bilateral eyelid retraction. And other than paranodes, and this is not paranodes because he has good eye vertical eye movements, other than paranodes, and by far more common than paranodes, is thyroid eye disease. And look at that lid lag. So when he looks down, his lids look like they're going up. So he's got not only lid retraction, but lid lag. He's, he has got thyroid eye disease. You don't even have to look at his eye movements. Just look at that picture. And I don't care what his eye movements are, nothing else does causes lid retraction and lid lag. So you don't need to even see his eye movements to make the correct diagnosis. And thyroid eye disease can look all sorts of ways. Um, it can look like our photo in the upper left. This is sort of the active, angry looking, painful kind of thyroid eye disease, very acute um, and just doesn't, doesn't look real comfortable. Or it could be white and quiet looking in our upper right, this marked bilateral upper and lower lid retraction. And in her case, she did have exophthalmus. It can be even unilateral. 
So in the bottom uh, frame, we see uh, upper and lower lid retraction in exophthalmos in a woman with thyroid eye disease. It just happened to be unilateral. Why? I don't know. It's a systemic condition like myasthenia. Sometimes myasthenia can look unilateral as well. So I don't know why, but it can look that way. And Graves' orbitopathy has multiple names. I, I, I actually tend to like thyroid eye disease. Um, it can be, uh, it's more common in women than men, but clearly men get it. 80% of patients usually present with the eye findings um, during or after being hyperthyroid. About 10% never get hyperthyroid. They are hypothyroid. And 10% are actually euthyroid. So I talk to patients about thyroid blood problem and thyroid eye problems. And I tell them they don't have a lot to do with one another. We can fix your thyroid blood problem, and it may have no effect on your thyroid eye problem. Um, I tell patients, how do we treat your thyroid blood problem? Well, usually we give you medicine to try to get your thyroid not to work as much. Sometimes we remove the thyroid. Sometimes we kill your thyroid with uh, radiation when we don't want to do any of those things to your eyes. And so we wait and we watch. Sometimes we will use pulse intravenous steroids once a week uh, for six to 12 weeks to see. I would, I would favor that in our patient we saw in the previous slide with a very active, angry looking thyroid eye disease. Sometimes patients come and say, oh, you know, they ruled that thyroid problem out with those blood tests. And I say, no, about 10% of patients are you thyroid. They do not have a thyroid blood problem, just a thyroid eye problem. The pathology, which I'm not gonna dwell on, is a, a lymphocyte and plasma cell infiltration. So you end up with edema, proliferation of orbital fibroblasts, an increased synthesis of glycosaminoglycans, uh, enlargement of extraocular muscles, et cetera. Here's a patient um, uh, from a long time ago before I was videotaping people routinely. And you can see just in the central photograph without even looking at her eye movements, she's got lid retraction. And you can quickly notice by looking at the eye movements that she has striking bilateral abduction deficits and if you look at the, the top center or any of the top frames, you'll see she really doesn't have great elevation. Uh, her right eye is sort of stuck slightly elevated compared to her left, but she has bilateral abduction and bilateral elevation deficits, most consistent with thyroid eye disease, plus you throw in the lid retraction and there you've got the diagnosis. I asked my residents when I showed them this, how do you think today she was being treated at this point? And the answer is, she was patching her right eye. How do you know? Because she only put makeup on her left eye. She didn't need to put makeup on her right eye. It was patched. And here's the, uh, what we see when we get scans. Uh, typically, and for reasons that are unclear, it's usually the inferior rectus muscle involved first, medial rectus second, superior rectus third, and lateral rectus fourth. So if you see someone you think has thyroid eye disease and all they've got is a big lateral rectus, probably need to think again. Um, here's it. So this is, of course, a coronal view showing bilateral symmetric enlargement of the muscles. Uh, here's a uh, axial view showing the very large uh, medial recti with the so-called tendon sparing. And you can see in our bottom photo how these patients may end up with a compressive optic neuropathy. As I tell the patients, your orbit is shaped like an ice cream cone, and at the back, it gets pretty narrow. If you have big fat muscles like this, you can imagine that that optic nerve, since the bone is going nowhere, the optic nerve loses if they're big enough and you can develop, of course, a compressive optic neuropathy. <clears throat> this is a patient who might look like, initially like thyroid. You might say, well, gee, there's that active looking chemosis. There's a, maybe there's a little lid retraction over here, although this eye looks and according to the patient feels completely normal. But the history is help, somewhat helpful here. And this history is that a week prior to these photos, this patient says, I was completely normal, no problems whatsoever. So thyroid eye disease usually doesn't occur acutely like that. Over a week, the eye got red, it's rather painful. And of course, this patient has double vision. You can see the eye is not abducting well. Um, it is moving otherwise okay, um, but there's a lot of chemosis, swell, uh, swelling, a little erythema around the orbit, and the differential diagnosis for this would include orbital cellulitis. So clearly, you'd want a, a CT scan 
um, uh, at minimum to look at the sinuses to make sure that there's not sinus uh, sinusitis, sinus opacification. If so, clearly you treat this patient with antibiotics um, and probably steroids. If there's no sinusitis and your, your thought about orbital cellulitis or your suspicion of orbital cellulitis is low, the most common second thing would be idiopathic orbital inflammation um, or orbital pseudo tumor. This is a CAT scan of a patient, not that same patient, but of a different patient who came in with a fairly acute onset of double vision, swelling in the eye socket, and they just had this big lateral rectus muscle on the left. Here you can see the very small, normal size lateral rectus on the right. This person had a subset of orbital pseudo tumor called orbital myositis. Orbital myositis, so it just was affecting one muscle in this case. And orbital pseudotumor um, or idiopathic orbital inflammation can involve the whole orbit. It can involve just one of the muscles, multiple muscles. Usually it's fairly it's acute or subacute in uh, onset. It's often very painful. Um, it's usually, but not always, usually unilateral. And it's, it's really uh, characterized by a, a, a typically rapid response to corticosteroids. So we put these people on a moderate dose of corticosteroids. I use prednisone, um, uh, 40 to 60 milligrams, and it's amazing. Within a couple of days, usually the patient is saying, wow, this is a miracle drug. Uh, in fact, I see them usually in a couple of days to make sure they're saying that. If they're not, I worry about my original diagnosis. And typically, these patients, of course, have no other symptoms. It's typically unilateral, sometimes bilateral, but it's not, there's no other systemic abnormalities going on. So orbital pseudotumor or idiopathic orbital inflammation. All right, we're going to switch tacks a little bit now. This is a young lady who was sent to me with abnormal eye movements. She is actually asymptomatic, asymptomatic. She went in for glasses, and the doctor said, gee, your eyes don't move well. And she said, oh, it nah, doesn't bother me. I don't really notice. And the, the referring diagnosis was bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, bilateral INO. And you can see the most striking thing about her eye movements are her bilateral adduction deficit. So here she is looking up. Here's her, so notice the adduction deficits. But I think you'll agree that if you look at her eye movements in general, she's 19 years old, she does not have normal elevation of either eye. That's not normal for a 19-year-old. And she doesn't have normal abduction or depression for a 19-year-old. So she, in fact, has more generalized ophthalmoplegia. In fact, her, she does have the, the adduction is the most striking, but she really has bilateral, relatively symmetric ophthalmoplegia with no double vision, and she has some ptosis, right? I mean, those not a lot, but for a 19-year-old, her eyes, eyelids are a little droopy, and she did produce some photographs from uh, when she was a kid when her eyelids did not look that way. So she has got a bilateral ophthalmoplegia with no double vision and bilateral ptosis. And this looks uh, is fairly characteristic of this condition called chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia or CPEO. This is a mitochondrial myopathy. It could be coded by a mitochondrial uh, DNA or it could be coded by somatic DNA. Usually when patients present early on, they're, they're, what they complain of is ptosis. For whatever reason, they don't seem to develop double vision. Sometimes if you ask them, hey, do you ever get double vision? They say, well, maybe, but you know, nothing that really bothers me. So they usually don't come in complaining of, to of double vision. They come in complaining, my eyelids are droopy. Please fix them. Don't forget to check orbicularis weakness. That's one of the fellow travelers. These patients can have some orbicularis weakness, usually not as profound as you might see, say, with myasthenia gravis you can get orbicularis weakness. The ophthalmoplegia is usually very symmetric. I would be hesitant to make a diagnosis of CPO in someone who does not have symmetric ophthalmoplegia. Remember that there's also a subset of these patients who have something called the Kern-Sayer variant. These patients can have a retinitis pigmentosa, RP, retinitis pigmentosa type fundoscopic look. But the important thing is, uh, they can get heart, the various degrees of heart block, so cardiac arrhythmia, and in fact, need pacemakers. If they don't have a pacemaker, they can die from complete heart block 
It doesn't happen overnight, but it can happen. So if you see a young person you think has CPEO, you want to get a electrocardiogram to look at their rhythm. I saw a patient recently who uh, came for a second opinion who was actually diagnosed with CPEO. And I asked about whether the, uh, the neuro ophthalmologist had ordered an EKG and they said no. But I did have an EKG because I had some minor surgical procedure and they said I have a bundle branch block. And I said, you've got Kern Sayers. You need to see probably a new ophthalmologist, but you need to see a cardiologist and talk about a uh, pacemaker to prevent you from having serious cardiac problems. They may also have increased cerebral spinal fluid protein and some ataxia. So if you see CPO, especially the younger person, and classically it's a male, not a female, but um, it's, uh, it can occur in females. She, in fact, did not have Kern Sayers. We ordered an EKG. That was the only test we ordered and sent her on her way. She did not want eyelid surgery, and there's nothing to do about her eye movement problem. This is a woman who presented in her 20s initially, that was some time ago, with ptosis. And she had ptosis surgery, and then she presented again in her late 30s with recurrent ptosis and had a little more eyelid surgery. And then came in in her early 50s, where you see her now, uh, wanting more eyelid surgery. And the ophthalmologist seeing her said, you know, you have the droopy lids, but your eyes don't move real well. They don't move much at all. And she clearly looks like somebody. She's got very symmetric, uh, generalized ophthalmoplegia, bilateral ptosis, two previous eyelid surgeries over the last few decades. So this clearly looks like CPEO. What's in the differential? Well, you got to think about myasthenia gravis and somebody with ptosis, but that, this is not the story of myasthenia gravis. She's never had double vision. She does note that when asked that she has to turn her head to the side more to see to the side. She can't look to the side, so she turns her head more, but this is a very gradual, uh, chronic, uh, progressive sort of a problem. And I said, gee, you know, this is something that can run in families. Do you have any kids? She said, oh, I have three daughters. And I said, oh, does any of them have the, your sort of an appearance? She said, you know, one of them looks kind of like I look. And I said, do you have any photographs? She said, oh, I don't have any photographs, but better, she's out in the waiting room. And here's her daughter. Uh, and you can see she's got CPEO. I, I, I've somehow lost her photographs of her eye movements, which weren't as bad as her mom's. But she had mild, generalized ophthalmoplegia and obvious bilateral ptosis, a little worse on the left than the right. The other thing that they both have is what's been called the masked faces, kind of this expressionless face, um, and they both had that. And so this is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. All right, another topic. So here's a woman, she's 75. She is pretty healthy, um, in fact, is taking no prescription medicines and says, I never get sick. Although about a month ago, she had a couple days of some sort of, she th thinks a viral um, stomach kind of a thing, some diarrhea. That went away on its own with no treatment over a couple days. But then she developed double vision, and this is how she looked. In fact, I was seeing her, uh, she was in the hospital not my hospital, a different hospital for a week. She had multiple, multiple tests, all of which were negative. One of them was still pending. And they sent her to me um, on her way home from the hospital. She stopped in my office and this is the way she looked. This is her up gaze, left gaze, right gaze and down gaze. That's it. So she has complete bilateral ophthalmoplegia. She had a small esotropia, that's why she had the double vision. And she has a little bit of ptosis, but not bad. So complete bilateral ophthalmoplegia. What sort of things might cause this? Well, you have to think about uh, myasthenia. I hope I don't have that uh, question slide here. You have to think about myasthenia because that can mimic anything that causes ophthalmoplegia or ptosis. She, in fact, in the hospital, already had a blood test for myasthenia. She already had a tensilon test, and she's had an MRI. All of that has been normal. So the question is, what is going on? So one test she had, she did have drawn, to their credit, that wasn't resulted yet, was the anti-GQ1B antibody test. So this is a fairly rare condition. We think this is probably the same thing as what was described long ago as the Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre. So people get ophthalmoplegia, 
They have problems with their deep tendon reflexes, of course, only if you check them. Oftentimes, this is a post-infectious problem, oftentimes after infection with Campylobacter. And for some reason, Campylobacter causes you to make antibodies that these anti-GQ1B antibodies that, that are specific for the internodal regions on ocular motor cranial nerves. And so you see primarily ophthalmoplegia. Sometimes it can affect pupils. So there are, I've seen and there are reports of pupil involvement, usually bilateral and symmetric. Um, and typically this condition gets better. She was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin for a few days and she came back uh, six weeks later because I told her that she probably would be getting better. Um, and she came, when she came back, she said, you lied to me because I am no better. And let's look at her eye movements. And you can see that clearly her eye movements are much better. So why was she saying, I lied to her? What, what's the problem? The problem is that although her eye movements are a lot better, they're not completely normal and she still has double vision. So remember for a patient, double vision is either there or it isn't. For her, she said, I'm no better. Fortunately, her daughter was with her and said, mom, your eyes are moving much better. I guarantee it. And I showed her the video and I showed her this video after I took it. And she said, all right, maybe you're right. She came back six weeks later with no double vision and normal eye movements. So the anti-GQ1B antibody syndrome. All right, so this is another fellow and I think eventually there'll be a polling slide. So I'm gonna ask you to vote on this. So think about it as we're talking about him. So he's 56, he has double vision just for the last week. He's treated for high blood pressure, hypertension and asthma. His visual acuity is normal 2020 or 6.6. His pupils were normal as well. His problem with the double vision was primarily when he was reading. So when he looked downward, he noticed the vertical binocular double vision and indeed had a very mild deficit in depression of the right eye. So he had a mild problem on the right with depression. Let's look at a video, not so much of his eye movements, but of his fellow travelers. So I'm gonna let you just look at this video here and in a moment we'll open the polling. And I'm not gonna give you any hints, I don't think, while we're watching the video. All right, let's open the polling and see what you guys think. So I'm gonna to try to get this out of the way over here. Um, so, is this myasthenia? Is this the third nerve palsy? Is this an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia or is this thyroid eye disease? And we'll give you another 10 seconds or so. Five, four, three, two, one, call it. All right, so good, very good. So the majority of you got this one right. This is indeed myasthenia. Um, a small number said third nerve palsy. A small number said INO, shame on you. Um, there's nothing about this that looks like an INO. I'm not even showing you his horizontal eye movements. Um, Graves disease, well, this we can get rid of the pole there. Um, Graves disease um, causes eyelid retraction. This guy has a little drooping of both eyelids, more on the left than the right. So I'm pretty quickly gonna eliminate Graves. Um, the other thing, other reason to eliminate Graves is Remember, the most common muscle involved in Graves' disease is the inferior rectus. And I didn't mention, maybe I should have, is that when those muscles get enlarged, they still work okay, they don't relax okay. So the most common pattern of ocular misalignment in Graves' disease is actually vertical misalignment when you look up, not when you look down. His problem is when you look down. So that would be not typical for Graves. Plus he has ptosis, not lid retraction. Third nerve palsy, well, third nerve palsy could cause a droopy lid, but this guy, this problem, as I said early on, he has a problem, his double vision is a problem with his right eye not moving all the way down. But once you look at the video, you notice, gee, he's got left ptosis more than right. This is a bilateral process. So you're gonna probably not be thinking about cranial nerve palsies as most likely, because it's not common to have bilateral cranial nerve palsies. 
So you're left with something more systemic. And the finding I'm trying to show you in the video is his left upper eyelid. Watch what happens when he looks from down to up. It moves up and then there's an immediately a little twitch downward, then another twitch. This is called Kogan's lid twitch sign. This is one version of it. I think I'm gonna show you another version in a moment. So this is Kogan's lid twitch in the setting of right deficit in depression, mild, left ptosis greater than right, this has got to be myasthenia gravis, got to be. So in myasthenia, in, as far as symptoms go, we think about variability and fatigability. Those are the hallmarks of myasthenia. That doesn't mean it has to be variable and fatigable, but you want to ask about it. So you can have variable and or fatigable ptosis or even double vision and even lag up thalamus, the inability to completely close your eyes because of weakness of the orbicularis muscle. Sometimes patients don't have um, double vision. Um, if there's a mild misalignment, they may just call it blurry. But if you ask them, does it get better when you cover each eye, they say, yes, it's something binocular. So if there's very mild misalignment, they may not say double. Also remember that non-myasthenic ptosis and double vision may get worse at the end of the day. In other words, if you just have levator dehiscence, and you're using your frontalis muscles all day to keep your eyelids open. By the end of the day, that may be, they may be weakening and it may be tougher. And most people with, with ptosis, for any reason, will say, oh, yeah, it's worse at the end of the day. My question to try to make increase or decrease my level of suspicion is, do you ever have to hold your eye open at the end of the day to see? If they say yes, that sounds like myasthenia. If they say, yeah, my lid closes at the end of the day, it's got to be myasthenia. And same with double vision. If someone has a, a mild misalignment of the eyes and they can use their fusional capabilities to overcome it, but they're doing it all day, it may get worse at the end of the day. So just because it, it sounds fatigable doesn't mean it is myasthenia. So what about the signs of myasthenia? Well, variable um, ptosis attempt, you can attempt to fatigue it. I'm gonna show you some video. Kogan's lid twitch, we'll show you that again. And then don't forget to check for orbicularis weakness. So here's our same patient. Look again at his left upper eyelid. Up, see it go up and then down. And up, and then there's a little twitch, another little twitch, Kogan's lid twitch. Let's look, I think I've got one more video. So here's a lady with obvious ptosis. This takes a second or two, I need to edit this, but you can look at her eye movements, which don't look terrible. Her, her lid is, see it's twitching just a little bit there. There's a better example, a little, oh, there it goes. Let's keep watching, just what, there it is, a little twitching of that, little twitch of that lid, let's look a little more. There it goes again. So she also has Kogan's lid twitch. There it was. There it goes. Okay, Kogan's lid twitch sign. Look for it. Here's a fellow who is going to look his ptosis on the right and double vision. This is real time, unedited. He's looking at my finger up above his head. Oh, there goes that lid. Fatigable right ptosis. Virtually nothing is going to look this way. You see it? He's got myasthenia gravis. And here we're checking orbicularis strength. This woman is trying to keep her eyes closed as tightly as she can. And you can see when I let go of either lid, it just kind of flops back into place. There is no tone in the orbicularis. This has got to be myasthenia. So look for variable ptosis, attempt to fatigue it, look for the lid twitch, check orbicularis strength. How about the motility signs? Remember, as I've already said, it can mimic any pattern. I've seen it mimic unilateral inos, bilateral inos, fourth nerve palsies, third nerve palsies, sixth nerve palsies. The, the, the measurements of alignment might vary, and they may have misalignment with even full-looking full eye movements. So here's that woman with the orbicularis weakness. She was actually sent to me by a neurologist with bilateral inos. You can see a striking adduction deficit I'm, I'm making her look in sustained right gaze to try to fatigue, see if I can fatigue her eye movements. I don't, it's not a really great example of fatigue, but here's her left adduction deficit. Watch when she looks to the right, which she will do in a moment. So again, 
no adduction. Well, that's why the neurologist thought this was a bilateral INO. She already had MRI and he said, gee, she's got a bilateral INO. Her MRI is normal. Now watch when she tries to look downward. So I'm going to hold her lids open. This is down gaze. That's it. So what the neurologist didn't appreciate was her basic complete lack of depression of each eye. So this is not an isolated bilateral adduction deficit. This is a bilateral adduction deficit and bilateral depression deficit. And when you check her orbicularis strength, there is no tone. This has got to be myasthenia. And here's a patient with fatigable ophthalmoplegia. So look at his right eye. We'll let the video loop. And watch what, look at how much sclera you see as time goes by. Again, this is unedited. And the video will loop. So watch, his eye's almost back into primary position at the end of this video, right about here. Here we are at the beginning of the video. So just in that much time, watch the eye gradually drift back towards center. The other eye is not moving. So this is fatigable ophthalmoplegia. So, can mimic anything, measurements may vary, movements may appear full, can be unilateral or bilateral. What about testing? Well, there's something called the sleep or rest test described many years ago now by Jeff O'Dell, a friend of mine, where you would have the patient just close their eyes for 30 minutes and you measure the, t the degree of ptosis before and then right when he, after 30 minutes, you come in, you go into the room, say, okay, open your eyes, look straight ahead, and you look to see an improvement in the ptosis. And here's an example of a rest test. So the fellow before the rest and after the rest, you can see the marked improvement in the ptosis after the rest test. The other test that we tend to do, because who's got 30 minutes, I don't, is the ice test. Um, this is a, a paper we published back um, in, I think, 2000, um, where we looked at 30 patients with ptosis of known causes, such as levator dehiscence, third nerve palsy, Horner syndrome, and we had 20 patients with myasthenia with positive blood testing or, and or positive tensilon testing. So 20 myasthenics with ptosis. We applied an ice pack for two minutes and found that none of the 30 patients with non-myasthenic ptosis, none, had improvement. Whereas 16 of the 20 with myasthenic ptosis had improvement of greater than one millimeter. Now, delving a little deeper into that, of the 20 patients with myasthenic ptosis, four had, or I'm sorry, three had complete ptosis of one of the lids. Cooling that eyelid did not help. Cooling the eyelid did not help. Um, our, uh, so of the 17 patients with incomplete ptosis, 16 of 17 had improvement of greater than one millimeter. So very specific and sensitive. If the ptosis is complete, all bets are off with the ice test. But what else causes complete ptosis? Yeah, third nerve palsy, pretty much it. So you got, you, you, usually you're not going to be fooled. So here's a fellow with ptosis on the right, obviously. You'll quickly notice he's got a left abduction deficit. So if you see a person, they're bilateral findings. Ptosis on one side, ophthalmoplegia on one or both sides. You gotta be thinking myasthenia. And I'm gonna show you his ice test in just a moment. So let's look at his degree of ptosis. At the, I think at the end of the video, we'll look at his ptosis again. So here, look at his obvious right ptosis, right? All right, let's look at his ice test. Here we are at the end of two minutes. Boom. So, and it quickly goes back because your eyelid warms up pretty darn fast. How does that work? Don't know for sure. We think we're cooling off the chemical reaction of the acetylcholine esterase. You cool it off, it's kind of like tensilon. It doesn't act the same way, but it's inhibiting, if you will, by temperature, inhibiting the acetylcholine esterase chemical reaction. So greater than one millimeter of improvement, positive test. You can do tensilon or endrophonium testing. We rarely, I, I rarely do this anymore, frankly. I haven't done a tensilon test in at least a decade. In kids, you can use something called pro, a neostigmine or a prostigmine. It's an intramuscular injection. The only reason to do that would be to try to make measurements in a kid who's not that cooperative and you need more time because the tensilon doesn't last for that long. Here's a tensilon test. This fellow has double vision. He's got an abduction deficit. He's got a little ptosis. I'm giving him 22 years ago now. 
an injection of Tensilon. Here a minute goes by, his lids pop open. He's looking at the chart at the end of the room. His double vision goes away. But within another minute or so, the effects of the Tensilon go away and it comes right back. So it's a diagnostic, not a therapeutic test. You can get blood tests, uh, the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies. I typically check the binding antibodies. There, there are blocking and modulating as well. I don't find those helpful. I usually just check acetylcholine receptor antibodies binding. The problem is that if, if it's just ocular, if the patient has no symptoms of systemic myasthenia, uh, then the blood tests are only positive 50 or 60% of the time. So I tell the patient, who has just ocular symptoms. Listen, we're gonna get a blood test. If it's positive, it's very helpful. If it's positive, you've got myasthenia. There's, there's almost no such thing as a false positive. On the other hand, if it's negative, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, there is no test that rules out myasthenia gravis. If there are systemic symptoms, it's much more likely to be positive. And if there are systemic symptoms, you can do repetitive stimulation, uh, single fiber electromyography. Muscle biopsies are really reserved for research institutes. We certainly don't do those. Uh, some places will, in the United States at least, will do uh, orbicularis EMG, even extraocular muscle EMG. Not many do that. So in summary for myasthenia, consider myasthenia in everybody with double vision or ptosis. At least think about myasthenia and look for the signs we've talked about. Check for the variable, fatigable ptosis, Kogan's lid twitch, orbicularis weakness. Don't forget that stuff. Remember that myasthenia can mimic any pattern of ocular misalignment. Hence, you need to consider it in anybody with double vision. Rest and or ice testing can be helpful. And again, just to make my point, consider myasthenia in everybody with double vision or droopy lids. So in summary, for ocular motility part two, Look for those patterns we talked about, brainstem patterns, INOs, one and a half, gaze palsies. Don't forget to check the fellow travelers. Look for orbital signs in all patients with ocular motility deficits, exophthalmus, chemosis, et cetera. Remember that myasthenia can mimic any motility pattern. Check for fatigability, orbicular strength, and the other signs that we talked about. So that's the end of motility part two. Um, I, there are some questions and people can type in questions. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that you can type in questions in the chat area. Um, I don't know if I have to, st I don't see any of the questions at the moment. I'm not sure if I have to stop sharing uh, in order to see those. Um, maybe the website administrator can help me out here. Um, you can stop, sharing, stop screen. sharing my screen and see what happens. Aha, that might be it. Okay, and let me check on questions and answers. Okay, and if anyone has any questions they want to type in, feel free to type them in as we're trying to answer the questions. Um, so let's see, I'll start with the why was she patching her right eye? I think this has to do with the um, patient with the thyroid eye disease. So in terms of patching and double vision, um, I usually the short run treatment for double vision, I mean, obviously if you, if you can cure the underlying problem, oftentimes we can't cure it quickly, is the short term treatment is, is occlusion. So it could be a patch. I like to use um, just scotch tape, uh, opaque tape on the lens if the patient's wearing glasses, that works great. Um, I don't care which eye they cover, as long as they only cover one of them at a time and don't switch the patch. So I don't, as long as it's not a kid who could be in, in the amblyopic age range, I don't like switching the patch. It makes the patient off balance every time they switch the patch. I don't care which eye they pick. They can pick the eye that's normal. They can pick the eye with ophthalmoplegia. Whichever eye they feel more comfortable with is the eye that, that, that we patch. Um, let's see. Um, a child age six years old with a horizontal gaze palsy, why the vision is subnormal or best corrected vision is uh, 618 orthotropic and primary will should be improved with patching. Well, I guess one question is why does she have a horizontal gaze palsy if you truly mean neither eye moves to one side or the other side or either side, then of course the question is why is that? If you mean, you know, does she have a Duane syndrome or like a like a an abduction deficit, clearly um, uh, um, that's a little bit of a different story. 
I think that if her best corrected vision looks symmetric um, and she stereo, I'm sorry, this thing keeps jumping on me. Um, she has poor stereo acuity and, but she's orthotropic in primary. Will she be improved with patching? Well, I'm not sure why she's amblyopic. You'd think if she has a, a mo ocular motility problem, she would have uh, some sort of strabismic amblyopia. I assume your question means that she is 618 OU, uh, which really makes no sense to me at all. Um, if she's 618 OU, then I wouldn't know which eye to patch. And if she's orthotropic, I don't think patching would help. So. I, I would probably feel more comfortable asking this to one of our um, pediatric ophthalmologists. I think this might be a good case to post on the CyberSight consult thing and, and give them all the information, and it would go to one of our pediatric ophthalmologists, probably not me, but that doesn't, doesn't add up well for me. What are the fellow travelers? So the fellow travelers are the things that you really want to think about when someone has a motility problem. So, and what things do you want to think about? Well, you want to think, well, what nerves and other findings might you see. So in Graves' disease and myasthenia and third nerve palsy, clearly the eyelids are very important. So one of the fellow travelers is eyelids. Is there ptosis? Is there lid retraction? Is there fatigable ptosis? Um, those sorts of things. Um, is there, um, uh, what about the pupils? So in third nerve palsy, we're very interested with the pupils and paranodes are interested in the pupils. So you wanna look for pupil anisocoria, difference in size in pupils. We wanna look for um, pupillary light near dissociation, how the pupils are reacting. So those are the two primary fellow travelers, but also, I mean, you're gonna look for orbital signs. Is there exophthalmus? Is there any chemosis? All right. Um, who treats MS, us or refer to neuro? So I always refer to neuro. I, I, I will treat acute um, double vision or optic neuritis with typically with high doses of intravenous corticosteroids, but I don't personally use the, the multiple sclerosis medicines. Anybody with MS, in my opinion, needs a neurologist to go over them systemically, and I let the neurologist recommend the form of chronic systemic treatment. I will treat with steroids acutely, but I always have them see a neurologist. Um, when can I plan for strabismus surgery in patients with myasthenia gravis? Almost never. Uh, that's, that's, I'm saying that sort of jokingly. Um, the, as you know, uh, myasthenia, and as we just talked about, one of the hallmarks is variability. So the, the, the times that I would consider uh, for business surgery and someone who I followed for probably at least a year with no significant change in their alignment. And even then, uh, the strabismus surgeon, if they're willing to do the surgery, is going to have to tell the patient, listen, we could do the surgery tomorrow and you could have a great result. And in two weeks, if your myasthenia acts up, you could be right back with double vision. So the patient has to be willing to take that risk. And so does the surgeon. Um, in the case of orbital myositis, when did you stop the corticosteroids? So good question. So usually what I do with um, uh, orbital myositis, I treat the patient for about a month with 40 or 60 milligrams of prednisone. I don't know the conversion offhand, but of prednisone. Um, usually they get, I want them back to normal before I start to taper the prednisone. So it's gonna be at least a few weeks to back to normal. The mistake I most often see is that people, you know, the person gets better in a week, the, the ophthalmologist says, great, they taper the steroids over another week, and guess what? The problem comes right back. So um, I usually taper them. I give them at least a week or two longer than when they're normal, and then I, I taper them over the next couple of months, next couple of months, um, like on a weekly basis, and then hope it doesn't come back. If it comes back, um, then I, I feel I've tapered too quickly. I bump them up and taper them more slowly. Will myasthenia gravis burn out after a certain period? Myasthenia gravis can um, go into, quote, remission, end quote, um, forever. It can go into remission for uh, a month, a year. I'll tell you, I showed you a, a video of a fellow with fatigable ptosis. The, the interesting backstory to that is that two years previously, he presented to me with double vision. He had what looked like a fourth nerve palsy. 
I, I, at that time, I thought, well, this looks like a, a microvascular fourth nerve palsy. Uh, he was 52 or three. He had high blood pressure. I said, listen, I think this is a microvascular fourth nerve palsy. I did not think about my, well, might have thought about myasthenia. I didn't think he had myasthenia. And I said, it's going to get better. Come back in six weeks. He came back better. Two years later, he called me and he said, oh, I've got double vision again, but my eyelid's drooping too. And I thought, oh, he's got a third nerve palsy. He came in with fatigable ptosis. So I was wrong two years previously. He went into remission for two years and it came back. So it could go into remission forever or never. Um, so I don't really use the term burnout. I would use the term remission. Can you clarify the time of the effect of Tensilon test? So the Tensilon or Edrophonium, you inject, the way the test is done is you, um, you in intravenously inject uh, the Edrophonium. You usually have 10 milligrams in your syringe um, you have a tube, a, a, a vial of atropine, um, you know, liquid atropine next to you to inject into the patient if his heart stops, which happened to me twice, which is why I don't do a lot of Tensilon tests. Uh, but you give two milligrams of the Tensilon. That is usually enough to give a positive response. So if you give two milligrams, you wait, usually it's in the 30 to 90 second range. And the, if the Tensilon's gonna have an effect, it'll have an effect. So if you get a positive response, the ptosis goes away. The double vision goes away. Don't give the remaining eight milligrams. The test is over. If it doesn't go away, then I give the other eight milligrams. And, if it's, and then if nothing happens, it's a negative test. But usually you see a response within 30 to 90 seconds. And it goes away within a couple minutes. Um, who treats myasthenia? Well, that's also a good question. Um, so I used to let the neurologist treat myasthenia. The problem is that I see a lot of patients with receptor negative ocular myasthenia. So that means they've had their acetylcholine receptor antibodies, they're normal. And I used to send those patients to the neurologist and say, hey, I'm sure this is myasthenia. And then I found out the neurologists were telling the patients, oh, I don't think you've got myasthenia. Your blood tests are normal. You don't have anything else going on. And they weren't treating them. So now I treat patients with receptor negative myasthenia myself. Um, and as long as they don't develop systemic symptoms, I don't have them see a neurologist. On the other hand, if they have positive blood tests, they're also more likely to develop generalized myasthenia. And then I always make them go see a neurologist to go over the rest of them. So they have a neurologist in case they have a problem. And I let the neurologist treat. Um, how long do you advise for patching in cases of Graves' double vision? So in Graves' double vision, I tell patients, listen, this condition usually runs a course over six to 24 months and then it burns out. Um, so I do use the term burnout for graves. Usually it burns out, which means it stabilizes. Um, so I follow them usually every couple of months. They patch for that time. Once I've decided they're stable, which to me means no change in their misalignment for four months, then I refer either treat them with PRISM if there's mild misalignment or refer them for strabismus surgery. Uh, can we have your email? Yes. Um, my email is very simple. It is uh, my last name, G-O-L-N-I-K, followed by my first name, K-A-R-L, with no punctuation in between, at gmail.com. So last name, first name, at gmail.com. Um, how do you diagnose external ophthalmoplegia? So I'm assuming you mean chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, or CPEO. I, personally, I think it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, there, are, there, are, there are genetic blood tests that can be considered. They don't capture everybody. In the United States, those genetic blood tests cost probably in the order of 1,000 US dollars, which usually in the United States is not paid for by insurance. Uh, so number one, there's no treatment for chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Number two, if the test result comes back normal, there's a little asterisk next to the result that says, by the way, this doesn't capture everybody with the condition. So my patients typically don't want to spend 1,000 US dollars for a blood test that doesn't lead to treatment and is all, doesn't always uh, give you an answer. Oh, hi, Chiku. Uh, who sends you more patients, physicians or ophthalmologists? Um, I would say probably most common are ophthalmologists, but very quickly followed by neurologists and in the United States, optometrists 
can practice independently and they see a lot of primary eye care. So I probably see, I will bet you two thirds of my referrals are from ophthalmologists and optometrists and one third are from uh, neurologists, neurosurgeons and some primary care doctors, but probably the majority of that other group would be neurologists. Um, uh, question, what are the brainstem patterns commonly seen? Um, so I think that the, the, the ones that we talked about at the beginning of this are the ones I try to cover the most common. There are, there are lots of potential brainstem syndromes, but certainly by far the most common one I see is internuclear ophthalmoplegia, uh, an INO, either unilateral or bilateral. The second most common is probably, probably a skew deviation. I don't see a lots of gaze palsies, but um, those are probably the most common. Um, I, I'm a nurse and I have a 34 year old male who presents with difficult seeing lateral vision of the left eye. To see the lateral the left eye is to move the left eye to see. Uh, so I assume that means there's a left, a temporal visual field defect. The vision, central vision is good in each eye. Eye, eye movements cannot move up and out movement of the left eye. No double vision, no ptosis, no injury. What could this be? So good central vision. And so it's unclear to me whether the problem is strictly a motility problem. In other words, the eye just doesn't move um, up and out. Or is there also a peripheral vision problem? I'm going to assume it's just an eye movement problem. So this, this would be a pattern that doesn't really fit a cranial nerve problem. Certainly, you know, the sixth nerve would be the nerve that would give you an abduction deficit. The abduction deficit um, should be present though, whether you're looking up or down. So if you're saying that the eye does move down and out okay, that's not a six nerve palsy. So it doesn't really fit a specific pattern. So in that scenario, I'd be interested in things like myasthenia. I'd be interested in a CAT scan of the orbits probably to look at the eye muscles. Could this be a, a large inferior rectus? Um, but that's probably the best I can do without more information or seeing uh, the patient. Is it safe to perform a tensilon test in the office? So for many years, I did tensilon tests right in the office. I, as I mentioned, I had two patients who um, uh, passed out because of, of low heart rate and who needed the atropine. Uh, that, this, after the second one, I started doing them. We have a same day surgery office in my building. We have seven ORs in my uh, eye institute. And so I started doing them in the, um, the downstairs under more monitoring because um, I didn't want someone dying in my office. So the answer is, um, I would rec if you're gonna do a tensile test, I'd recommend doing it with at least some monitoring available. I think you could be in trouble if you have a problem and you know, a known risk is stopping your heart. Um, I would, like I say, I haven't done a tensile test in at least 10 years because of the other testing available. Um, do we need to search for a thymoma for all age and, my, and myasthenia? The answer is yes. Uh, I'm hoping at some point the answer will be no. Ask me the last time I found a thymoma. I'm not sure I've ever found one in ocular myasthenia. Nevertheless, we usually do look. Does myasthenia involve the pupil? No. Um, after rest, the pupils look dilated. Ah, good pickup. I wasn't going to mention that, but we did dilate the patients while we did the rest test because it took 30 minutes. So you could argue maybe the dilating drops improved the ptosis, but within minutes after that uh, photo was taken, the eyelid went right back to the droopy lid. So it wasn't just the dilating drops that caused the ptosis to improve, but we did dilate the patient because I didn't want to wait 30 minutes, then dilate the patient. Uh, waiting 30 minutes was hard enough. Um, the ice pack test is done for two minutes. And believe me, it gets cold. Try it yourself. I have patients complain, oh, this is getting cold. I say, well, the alternative is a medicine that might stop your heart. That shuts them up pretty fast. Um, use of clinical activity score for Graves' disease. Yeah, I, I know there is a clinical activity score. I certainly, uh, if you find it helpful, use it. I don't find it helpful. I don't use it. But if you're writing papers on Graves, then you probably want to do it. If it helps you yourself, use it. I personally don't. What is the role of botulinum toxin in the case of Graves or myasthenia? Hmm. Um, 
I think I know of no role for botulinum toxin in myasthenia, and I would avoid it. Um, Graves, I, I think the role in Graves, I guess, could be, you know, that when you have these tight muscles, um, once they're tight for a while, they can scar that way. Uh, I, I think that some of our strabismus surgeons might use botulinum intraoperatively uh, to try to loosen them up a bit, but I don't know, and I don't do strabismus surgery myself, but I think some of our surgeons sometimes will use botulinum toxin in graves, although I'm, I am not positive about that. Um, again, the features of anti-GQ1B, that should be not 21, 1B. So that, the features are, um, this again is the, the variant of Guillain-Barre, the ocular variant called the Miller-Fisher variant. So they can have any degree of ophthalmoplegia. My patient just happened to have striking, complete bilateral ophthalmoplegia. So you can have um, ophthalmoplegia of any sort of sort. It can be unilateral, bilateral, more often bilateral. It, there can be ptosis. And sometimes the pupils can be affected. They are not in my, the patient I showed, the pupils weren't affected. In the patient I saw after that, the, pa the pupils were affected. Um, is there any factor or favor for remission of myasthenia? Does it depend on the severity of clinical presentation or anti-acetylcholine? Um, I don't think so. Uh, there's some, there's some, uh, evidence in the literature to suggest that if you if you treat someone early on, like in, in, with the initial diagnosis of ocular myasthenia with corticosteroids, that might prevent progression to generalized or systemic myasthenia. That's not uh, it's not universally agreed that that's the case. And there are people who've tried to study it. There's no there's no study that you know randomized controlled clinical trial that's answered that question. Um, so I don't know about favors for remission. I'm trying to think um, just in my own patients. That's a very good question, though, and I, I don't know that anyone's really looked at that, and I probably could have one of my fellows retrospectively look at our patients to try to figure that out. So maybe we should study it. I don't know the answer, and I'm not sure that there – I would have to do a literature search to see if there is an answer. Um, as a subspecialty, interophthalmology is quite different from others. I do not know if about to ask my questions about that or personally. I would say probably personally, since that's not really apropos to the topic at hand and uh, we're running over time. But you, if you have my email uh, that I mentioned, uh, you can feel free to, to email me if you like. Um, how, did I, how do differential diagnose fourth year palsy and skew deviation? Ah, um, so. That's a good question that can get pretty complicated, but in general, um, for me to diagnose a fourth ear palsy, I want to see all the aspects of a fourth ear palsy. I want to see worsening with ipsilateral head tilt. I want to, I want to see torsional double vision. I want to use a double Maddox rod and measure torsion. Uh, I want the, the, the misalignment to be worse when the patient looks down and when sp specifically when they look down and to the right. I want it to get better. So in other words, I wanted to fit the pattern of a fourth nerve palsy. I see patients frequently who say, well, I think it's a fourth nerve palsy, but it doesn't, there's not, there's, it doesn't make any difference whether they look up or down. Well, that's not the pattern of a fourth nerve palsy. Oh, sorry. Yeah, skew deviation. So, so I think the answer is it can be tough to make that, uh, that, that decision. In the skew deviation, um, most of the skews I see are pretty comitant. So if there's a six prism diopter vertical misalignment in primary, it's six when they look up and six when they look down. Um, the other question that's more complicated and I don't want to get into and, and is the ocular tilt reaction. That's a whole other story. But I think the, the difference to me is I'm looking for the pattern of a fourth nerve palsy. That does not to say that, uh, that myasthenia couldn't, or I'm sorry, a skew could, might not mimic it, but I, that's the way I'd leave that, I think. Frequency and how, di and how diagnosis of Eaton-Lambert. So I didn't mention Eaton-Lambert. The main reason I didn't mention it, and this is a perineoplastic syndrome that can look like myasthenia, except that this can get better. Uh, instead of fatigability, it actually can improve with repetition. It is perineoplastic, which means that, unfortunately, there is an underlying cancer that may or may not be already diagnosed. Small cell lung cancer would be the most common. I've seen it in other cancers. But in my mm, 
pushing 30 year career of neuro ophthalmology, I've seen one Eaton Lambert syndrome. So you might get tested on it, but you probably aren't going to see it. Or if you do, it's, you're not going to see it much. <clears throat> How do we diagnose and treat myasthenia in patients with thyroid eye disease? So another good question, and it gets to the, the point I didn't make, which is that there is a reported a, a small a, a chance of association. Both thyroid eye disease and myasthenia are autoimmune problems. And when someone has one autoimmune problem, they're more likely to have two. Um, and so there is, and I think in the literature, it says maybe 5% of thyroid patients might have myasthenia. That seems very high to me. So how do you diagnose it? Very difficult. Of course, if you have someone you're pretty sure or you know has had thyroid eye disease and now they develop ptosis, well, that should not be happening with thyroid eye disease. If you see someone you think has thyroid eye disease and they have an exotropia, exo, that would be very unusual in thyroid eye disease. Why? Because the lateral rectus muscle is usually not affected in thyroid. And that's the muscle that would have to be affected because thyroid is restrictive. That's the muscle that would have to be affected to give you an exotropia. So if you see someone with you think, you think has thyroid eye disease and they're exotropic, they may have thyroid eye disease, but they may have myasthenia as well. So, of course, in that scenario, scenario you're going to check acetylcholine receptor antibody levels. If there's ptosis, you're going to do an ice test. You could do a tensilon test if you do tensilon tests, but sometimes that can be difficult. And I think, finally, the last question was another good question, which is, is there, any, is there a real effect of selenium in thyroid eye disease? And the answer is, I'm not sure if there's a real effect, but there, there is at least one um, uh, study where they took patients, and I can't quote you the article, I'm sorry, but if you, if you Google or PubMed selenium and thyroid eye disease, you'll find it, uh, where they, they treated patients randomly with thyroid eye disease with placebo versus selenium. And I think the dose was, uh, I want to say 300 milligrams BID. I could be wrong though. Check that. Um, they, and I, and I do recommend selenium for patients with, you know, mild to moderate thyroid eye disease. Um, and in the study, basically they had the patients fill out a sort of a quality of life questionnaire. Gee, how bad are your eyes? Um, before starting the placebo or the selenium. And then they treated them for a few months and asked them the same questions. And they did show that the patients taking selenium felt as a group, uh, felt that there was improvement in their eye symptoms compared to the group that were getting the placebo. So selenium, at least in the United States, is available over the counter. There's no prescriptions. I tell patients, listen, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna have a huge effect on bad thyroid eye disease, but in my patients who are, you know, have uncomfortable eyes, which is a lot of them, I recommend trying selenium. All right, I think that is the end of the questions. Um, so thanks for everyone for participating and um, uh, for asking the questions. I think um, that's, that's it for the ocular motility a part portion of our uh, neuro ophthalmology. I, um, I believe we have a couple of other um, uh, potential topics coming up. One of them, uh, I, there was another, going to be another talk on optic neuropathies. We, we covered a lot of optic neuropathies in part one and part two, but there's certainly some we didn't really cover that can be part three. That would include things like papilledema, um, and I'll have to look back and see what other things we didn't cover. And then the other uh, neuroophthalmology webinar in the future will be one on uh, neuroimaging. So I thank everybody for their participation. Um, good to uh, quote unquote see everyone. Uh, have a good day.